So myself and Alex are kind of going to um, talk at this level. What are the, where are we in terms of the gender pay gap in Australia? Uh, what are the drivers um, for the gender pay gap? And then have a look at what are some of the remedies that we've tried to put in place in Australia and perhaps some comments on the extent to which we think that these are effective. Um, we have the challenge to do that between us in 15 minutes, but I think my lovely chair who, who is my collaborator, as you can see, because we've put the chair as also uh, an author on the paper because Marion and I, as you probably know, uh, along with Alex, work very closely together. So our thoughts as well as our dress sense are usually <laughs> as one. <laughs> Even I would like you to note that we also have the same coloured shoes on. Yeah. <laughs> the, mem the memo was issued. Okay, so techno. Yeah. Okay, so we have, uh, you know, in the context of all of this, of course, is quite some significant change in the labour force uh, when we're looking at the gender pay gap and some of the challenges that are facing uh, women in employment. Um, we have seen quite significant changes uh, in uh, employment participation, labour force participation of women over the past generation. Uh, women no longer drop out of the labour force, so to speak, uh, when they have uh, acute care needs, particularly when they have young children. And in fact, those of you who've looked at longer term um, uh, analysis of women's labour force participation rates in Australia will know that we used to have a dip in the uh, after the period of the birth of a first child for a woman, um, which would come up, not quite recover, and then drop off um, in terms of uh, who's working and, and how long they're working. What we have now in terms of the generation of women who are having their first children now at about 31 or 32 is we see labour force participation going up. In fact, it kind of curves upward a little bit when they have their, their children and then plateaus out over the longer term. So we've seen a significant change in women's participation rates uh, and also in terms of the, the nature across their, their, uh, their broader lives as well. Um, we've seen quite some significant changes in terms of the industry mix. Those of you who had a look at the census data recently will know that uh, growth and projected growth in terms of jobs in Australia are all in very feminised jobs. So there's a lot of there, there's, uh, real drivers there in terms of demand uh, for women's employment to increase further still from industry and from government. Uh, we've seen some um, significant change in policy and regulation, uh, particularly in the last uh, seven or eight years, um, around equality um, and different mechanisms to get at it. Um, and we've seen, we would say, lots more conversations about gender equality. I think that's something that Marion probably could observe across her research uh, lifetime, um, that once the sorts of things that we used to research uh, in terms of gender equality were seen as a little bit odd um, and now sort of mainstream business school uh, research uh, areas and that for me anyway is uh, quite a blessing um, and, and quite interesting and I think that reflects what's going on in regulation policy and out there in business um, and as we talked about in the last session jobs are changing as well however we also uh, are looking at uh, women's uh, experience at work in the context of quite some significant continuity as I'll get to we still see many um, areas of difference for women compared to men in terms of what we would term the architecture of discrimination which is about glass ceilings glass walls and the glass uh, and the the sticky floor. We still see quite some significant gaps and traps for women in terms of earnings, in terms of uh, seniority gaps, in terms of the care gap at home um, and in relation to a range of things such as discrimination at work. Uh, we still see uh, jobs being gendered and undervalued in terms of the nature of the work that's being performed. Um, where highly feminised jobs, particularly those in the caring sectors, are absolutely undervalued, as we would see it, um, because of the gendered nature of the workforce and the work. Um, sexual harassment and discrimination remain rife and troubling. And we also, uh, we feel, because of the data that we have in terms of um, the gender pay gap, we feel that we have really quite inadequate legal structures and remedy to deal with quite complex problems. Um, little smarty pants comment, comment at the bottom there from us, shall we inquire further? Um, now Marion and I uh, and Alex between us have made submissions to at least 10 national inquiries in the last uh, seven or eight years which have looked at everything from uh, the gender pay gap to childcare to gender equality very broadly, women in leadership, uh, gender reporting data. So we, we have had uh, at least uh, 10 inquiries uh, during that time um, and they've all found there is an architecture of discrimination and difference. Uh, there are enduring gaps and traps. Uh, gender uh, is uh, predominant in terms of shaping what, how work and, is valued and how unpaid work is done. Sexual harassment is rife and so is discrimination. So we know, we know, okay? Uh, we know, we've had many, many of these inquiries. I think it's about time to maybe stop with the inquiries and start with some action. <laughs> 
that's just my two bobs worth. Um, Okay, so this is the gender pay gap and how it's been bubbling along. This is just looking between 1997, so quite a short run, 1997 and 2017. It looks quite volatile there, but really the, the differences between the top and the bottom are between 15 and 18 per cent. Um, longer run looking across 30 years looks much the same. It's not particularly volatile, it's pretty stable actually. Um, and that's looking at just one measure, that's typically what we look at for the gender pay gap, which is um, the romantically named AWOTI. Uh, which is average weekly ordinary time earnings, and that is looking at uh, full-time employees um, at their average earnings, excluding bonus, excluding other loadings and whatnot. So it sort of tries to take out a bunch of the differences between men and wim women in the labour force. But there are many other measures. I won't go through these too much, but to say that AWOTI is one measure, um, and uh, there are many others collected by the Workplace Gender Equality Agency uh, by... Uh, the ABS in terms of the employee our, our earnings and hours uh, catalogue um, and also in terms of international data sets like the OECD. So the question is not so much is there a gap um, and I keep this by my um, by telephone every time I do any media uh, because every time I do I get uh, a bit of Twitter war going on about yes this made up thing called the gender pay gap. It exists, it's not, it's not a matter of whether it's there, it's a matter of the scale. Um, and best case scenario in some measures is actually AWOTI, which is the one that we typically look at. Uh, if you actually look at some of the other measures, uh, such as the Workplace Gender Equality Agency's uh, data, and that's looking at companies of over 100 employees in the private sector, you have some gaps in occupations that are actually closer to about 45% than they are to that 15%. I have an absolute... Uh, mistake in number two there in that finance and insurance is not the lowest, um, it is the highest uh, of any industry and it is not 9.6%, it's 29.6%, so I'll have to correct that for you. So, it is uncontroversial that we have a gender pay gap, but where does it come from? So, as I talked about, we, we, we often try um, in our group to look at the architecture of discrimination and difference for women. And that's about looking at the glass ceiling, and most of us know a lot about the glass ceiling, and I'll talk about that briefly. The glass walls, we are talking a little bit more about lately, which I think is very good and perhaps is um, going to be a driver for change. Uh, we talk less about the sticky floor and, and that as a driver for the gender pay gap. So if we have a look just at the glass ceiling, so we all know what that is. That's that women can see through uh, organisational hierarchies, but it's really difficult to make it through. It's the, you know, the pyramid within organisations and our research across many different organisations, sectors, occupations, uh, whatever you want to look at. Again, it's not a matter of whether there is a pyramid, it's a matter of what the gradient looks like. Um, that's just some uh, data there for you from the Workplace Gender Equality Agency about how few women are in very senior roles um, and also how few women, uh, if you look at AICD data, how few women are in um, directorships um, across different industries, um, looking at the ASX in particular, is this data the ASX, ASX 100. We have seen some change in the ASX uh, outcomes um, by gender in the last 10 years, which is really fabulous. And in part, that's been about quite some advocacy in business um, and quite some advocacy in the sort of policy debate about uh, needing to have more women and more representative organisations. So whereas in 2010 we had 90% um, of men were the... 90% uh, of directors on the ASX 100 were men, uh, we now are in the happy situation where it's 80% of the directors of the ASX 100 are men. Uh, which is, doesn't sound great, but it is quite a significant change. Okay, glass walls are also um, a, a really significant challenge and we see them as a critical driver um, for pay inequality. And in fact, the very recent, the most recent um, submission we made to a national inquiry was uh, to the Occupational Segregation Inquiry by the Senate, um, the Australian Senate, and that, the outcomes of that found that it was about 16% of the gender pay gap could be explained by glass walls. And by that we mean occupational and professional segregation, uh, where the majority of Australians, so over 60% of Australians, work in um, an industry that is dominated very much by one gender. Um, so wh whilst we tend not to refer anymore to things like women's work or men's work, in fact, if you look at the realities of the labour force in Australia, we do actually have jobs that are women's jobs and jobs that are men's jobs in terms of who occupies them. Think of the, the classics of the childcare worker, the aged care worker and the tradie. Um, and this is a, a really significant issue because of the impact that the glass walls have for progression up to the glass ceiling. So they're all very much interconnected. 
Okay. The sticky floor is something that receives less attention and that really denotes that at the bottom parts of the labour force, and I'm not saying the bottom in terms of uh, socially and economically useful jobs, um, but about jobs that are uh, the lowest paid. Um, and the jobs that are the lowest paid that have a negligible or a very poor career path, whether that's because of award structures or whether it's just because of the, the standard industry rates in a particular sector, the majority of those employees um, tend to be women. Um, and interestingly, going back to the census again, um, where we've seen really significant growth and, and, as I said, projected growth is going to be in uh, those areas, particularly in health and human services. So really critical jobs uh, for our economic performance and for the, our social well-being. Um, so looking particularly in areas such as uh, aged care and, and jobs associated with things such as the NDIS rollout uh, will, have a, uh, will grow, absolutely, and they will be feminised jobs. Um, now, what's interesting there is when we look at, okay, the, what can we do regulating around that point, we must remember that all of the research evidence shows that uh, women who are working in jobs in the, the lower rung um, are absolutely acutely affected by changes in minimum standards and absolutely affected disproportionately from men to changes in things such as penalty rates. How am I going? And with that, I think I'm going to hand over to Alex, who's going to tell you what are we going to do about it all. And I just want to assure Marion Ray, I did have stripes in my suitcase today, but I chose spots. Obviously a big mistake. Um, right, well, moving on from what Ray was discussing, I just want to cover in this slide about the unpaid um, work gap and the gender imbalances there. As you can see, over two-thirds of, of women work part-time. Um, and that is reflected in the amount of unpaid household and care work which they do, which is about um, two-thirds of the total. Now, we are rather short of data on this. Uh, the ABS decided to stop collecting the relevant time use data 12 years ago, so we don't actually know if, if much progress is being made in this area because other measures which are provided aren't quite as good. Um, as Bet Ray's discussed, part-time work is limited to certain industries, occupations, and occupational levels, and, and part of that is the glass, glass walls approach of job segregation. Um, it seems to limit career progress, and men and women who seek flexibility often report uh, facing, um, they both face a, a sort of flexibility state uh, stigma. Workplace a demand at the workplace for flexibility is huge, and I mean employee-led flexibility rather than employer-led um, flexibility. There was a, a survey earlier this year, an international one, which said in Australia there was about 60% of women uh, were still wanting further flexibility and 40% of men. So it's not that, that different in terms of men and women both needing flexibility, often for uh, caring and other responsibilities. But the, in the workplace, uh, the organizational studies, Ray and Marion in particular, have done, and I'm doing a bit myself, uh, it's obvious that role, the role of managers as gatekeepers to flexibility goes on and on, being pretty critical. And that within organizations, there's a real battle to be fought about uh, what flexibility can be made further available. And who gets it? You know, that it's not a privilege, it doesn't require trade-offs. So I'm going to move on very, very briefly to the legal um, aspects of equal discrimination, equal remuneration uh, legislation in Australia. I want to acknowledge the work, obviously, of Meg Smith, Andrew Stewart, who's here, Sarah Charlesworth and Fiona MacDonald, and I've, they're the references I put on the slide, who've done a huge amount of work in this area, unpacking what's, what's going on. Just looking first um, at the Fair Work Act, which I think of as the industry-wide Australian approach to rectifying gender pay inequality, when you come from an English uh, individual dispute background, there's huge potential in this, in this approach. But in the federal arena in recent years, the, it really seems to have got quite stuck. Uh, as you know, there was one successful case run in the uh, social and community sector industry, uh, which kept culminated in 2012 in an award of, of increased pay to those workers. But more recently, there have been problems around the childcare case, which, of course, um, 
Ian Ross could fill us in uh, much more uh, fully than I can. Uh, but the essential difference seems to be that uh, the requirement for comparators, for male comparators. The Sachs case didn't. It relied on looking at whether the work was undervalued due to gender reasons, because of the gender nature of the work, the gender nature of the workforce. And it looked at those jobs sort of by themselves, in a way. There was no need for comparators, so they could have been brought if they wanted. Whereas the childcare case is taking a different approach, which requires male comparators. And that is very problematic, particularly in workforces which are very segregated. For obvious reasons, it's very hard to find uh, appropriate comparators. And if you go outside your industry, that may cause further, further problems. Um, just on the WGEA, which I was lucky enough to work uh, in during the transition uh, to the new legislation in 2012 and 13. The Workplace Gender Equality Agency uh, is really the Australia's response at a company level to gender pay inequality, and it impacts on employers of about 4 million employees, so it covers a, a, lot of, a third of the workforce, roughly. It collects very good data. It publishes a lot of it in aggregate form, which actually does really educate employers and the public. And this data, as Ray shown in her earlier slide, really corroborates the lack of change in gender pay gaps seen elsewhere in the data. But basically, there's no compulsion uh, involved in, uh, the, in the, you just have to report, you don't actually have to improve. There's very little auditing uh, able to be undertaken, and of course, with very little compulsion, just the requirement to publish a report, however inadequate. Um, there's not much stick either. I think um, one of the issues is naming and shaming uh, people on the, um, on the website. I think there are about 40 there at the moment. Uh, there's also no publication of gender pay gaps by company. Now, I think that's an incredible shame because all data is there. It's published at aggregate level. It, it's aggregated, in fact, for employers. So I think that the fact that the U, even the UK, I mean, even the UK is moving forward on this issue next April and requiring companies, large companies, to publish their gender pay gaps in various ways, that data is already in waiting to go, as far as I understand, in the Gender Workplace Equality Agency. These are, the, these are our broad conclusions. I don't really have time to go into them, but I hopefully they'll spark some sort of discussion. I just say that the OECD in particular just issued a, an updated gender um, equality report, which they call an uphill battle, which I think says it all, and they find things are very, very stuck, especially on gender pay equality. <laughs>